And he said to him, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter. They'll never get in. And then it says he took the children in his arms and he put his hands on them and he blessed them. It, the, the creator of the universe said these, these are more valued than anything else. And I'm going to prove it to him. I put my hands on him. He wasn't putting his hands on anybody else. He was putting them on children because he counted valuable. And he counts you very valuable, Miss Randley. And so today we want to dedicate you and your folks to the Lord and to his kingdom work. So let's pray. Guys, thank you for allowing us to be together. And we're here because we want to be as much as we can be a part of Renly's growth, physical and mental, but most especially spiritual. God, we pray for Renly that you would bless her life, that you would encourage her and strengthen her, that you'd surround her with uh, your angels, and Father, that she would dwell in your presence. God, that you would keep your hand on her and guide her. Father, that you would use her in a great way in your kingdom work and that one day we'd be able to be together forever in your forever family. We thank you for allowing us to be right here and we ask for your blessing, especially on this move for Shannon, for Shelby, God, we just pray that you would make this move an incredible blessing, not just to them and the Renly, but to the folks that are around them, that you would use them in such a way that people would know that they're following you. Forgive us for the times that we fail you. Direct our steps, we're willing, Father, we have no idea what's coming next. And we're not ready, but we're absolutely willing. And so we ask you to guide us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, guys. Welcome to Pauline Online Church. Uh, my name's Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. And we're so thankful uh, that you've chosen to join us online this morning. Uh, it's becoming harder and harder to interact with you guys. And so here's what I'd love to ask you to do. If you're tuning in this morning, either on Facebook or YouTube, a couple things, a couple different ways. Go give you a couple options to, to interact. I would love for you to, to jump in the chat or the comment section and just let us know you're, you're here, where you're tuning in from. Uh, greet, if you see somebody else is on there, would you greet one another? Or the other option is, man, I would love for you to shoot out a text to uh, somebody on our staff. Maybe you uh, have a, a number to one of our pastors or my number. Anyway, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know that you're tuning in and watching. Uh, I so appreciate uh, Ryan and Kira and the guys that uh, do so much work to uh, get our services ready, uh, both online and in person. And so uh, it's been, kind of, you know, it's a weird time, but we um, are missing you guys and are looking for ways to interact with you uh, if you're uh, staying at home and, and being safe. And we appreciate so much the caution that everyone, whether you're in person or, or at home, that everyone has, uh, has shown over these past few weeks and months and the care and the notes and encouraging uh, uh, texts that we're getting about uh, all that we're doing. So thank you guys for doing that but like i said we really want to interact with you in some way shape or form and if there's anything you need anything that we can do to serve you any help that you uh, need during this time uh, please don't hesitate to ask we'd love to help you in any way we can uh, have a couple announcements as we jump into uh, the uh, worship part of our uh, service this morning uh, August the 5th. For those of you that have kids in our children's ministry uh, coming up this fall, we've got some things, exciting things planned. And I don't really want to tell you just yet, but I want you to mark August 5th on your calendar uh, because we've got uh, some things in the works and some ways to uh, just to get back into the, the rhythm of uh, meeting and doing children's ministry and we're not really sure what all of that is going to look like come the fall and we'd love for you guys to pray about that and pray about uh, our small groups and our Sunday school and our children's and teen and and all of our, our Sunday school uh, ministry we're, we're trying to uh, be as wise and as cautious as we can keeping everybody as safe as we can uh, 
uh, but that's coming up uh, in the next few weeks. And so we'll also have an August worship guide and what we think August is going to look like uh, in terms of our church uh, here on site. And so be uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, also on August the 9th, uh, we're going to have Russell Knight uh, both online and uh, here in person. Uh, we tried to have Russell a few weeks ago, but that didn't work out. So we're looking forward to having him and his family. And uh, we're going to take this time to, to get to know uh, Russell and his family and uh, also what God is doing through Story Church. And then we're going to hear a message from Russell. So that's coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, as most of you already know, uh, there was an executive order passed about wearing uh, masks and uh, what we'd love for you to do that comes in effect tomorrow uh, on Monday but if you're planning on attending in the next few weeks uh, in person uh, we're gonna encourage you guys to to wear masks and and that's been our, our mo through this whole time as we want to operate with with as much caution uh, for the people around us uh, with as much grace and understanding and, and all of you guys have. And so if you're planning on attending, we're going to encourage you to wear a mask as you enter the building, wear it until you sit, uh, get to where you're seating or sitting uh, in the seats. And then, uh, of course, if you're comfortable, you can take it off and then ask that you put it back on as you're exiting the building. And so uh, that's going to be our encouragement moving forward. Uh, and, and how we're gonna operate in the middle of all of this. And, and so we appreciate everyone's understanding. We appreciate everybody's caution. Uh, as we jump into worship, uh, I would love to read some verses to you out of John chapter 10. And this is Jesus, um, and he's speaking to the Jews and his disciples around him. And, but uh, we know God as, as the good shepherd, right? Jesus says he's the good shepherd. But listen to what he says in verse 27 of John chapter 10. He says, my sheep, hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand uh, my father who has and my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand I and the father are one and I just thought that such a great uh, reminder right it is the good shepherd Jesus the God of the universe uh, knows us. He knows our name. And, and we, uh, those of us that are followers of him, we, we follow him. We have eternal life. It says we'll never perish and no one will be snatched out of, out of his hand. And so there's a security there that we gain, right, in uh, knowing that the good shepherd knows us and that we are securely and firmly in his grip in his hand. And I, I pray that that's a reminder to you as we enter into worship that you guys, as you're worshiping there from home or from wherever you're worshiping, that you would just lift up praise and, and worship to God our Father. And as you hear his word, that you respond to it and that you'll just choose to follow. That's our prayer for, for all of us, whether you're in person or at home, uh, we wanna be followers that, that know and operate, uh, knowing and believing and standing firm in the fact that God has us in his hand. So let's pray and we'll go into worship. Father, thanks so much for this time. Thanks for uh, my church family. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship together. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful that you know each one of us by name and by heart. And so Father, we, we want to be reminded constantly that you have us in, in, in a firm grasp of your hand. And, and Lord, no one can, can snatch us out of your hand. And so we're so thankful for that. Pray with us. Lord, we pray that you'd be with us as we go into worship. And Lord, that you'd be honored by our worship and by our lives. We pray all these things in your name.
that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your
Good morning, Pauline Baptist Church, and welcome to our online services this week. Hope that you've had a great uh, week so far. Uh, we were gone last week, as you uh, realize, we went to Story Church and super excited about what God is doing up at Story Church. And I want to take the opportunity to share just a little bit about our trip and share a little bit about what's going on up uh, in Northwest Arkansas and Bentonville. Of course, for many of you, you know that we uh, voted uh, this last month uh, to come alongside of Story Church as a co sending church, uh, specifically focusing on Brother uh, Russell Knight and Belinda and uh, their two children, Ryan and Jana. And so we're super excited about it. So anyhow, uh, there's a group of four of us ran up there and we're with Pop-Up Church this past week. I want to share a couple pictures with you for uh, how that went and introduce you to some of the team members that are up there. And again, we're super excited to partner with Story Church. And uh, let's go to that first one. Uh, this is Mia, the new worship leader that's come in uh, to work with Story Church, had a great service. It was, again, Pop-Up, the first Pop-Up Church that uh, they've had since COVID. And just kind of, we'll scroll through these. Uh, this is Aaron Johnson, of course, the lead planter there uh, of Story Church, and uh, we, we know Aaron very well. And the next one is a picture of Russ. Uh, we're super excited again to come alongside of Russ and Belinda. And then this is kind of what it looked like from our, our perspective outside. We had several families that were there. I know that it was exciting for them to be back together, uh, again, post uh, somewhat post-COVID, I'd say post-COVID, but we're still in the midst of it, but uh, since quarantine, uh, so it was a good opportunity for them to be together. And let's go that. This is the, the, those of us that went. Clayton, uh, chairman of our missions committee, was able to go, and of course, Ben and our youth pastor, Matt, and myself, and some of you will know uh, Daniel Bowers uh, was there. He and Kaylee are attending Story Church, and of course, uh, Aaron Johnson. Uh, but again, uh, our partnership is a little bit deeper now uh, with Story Church as we've come alongside as Russell Knight's uh, sending church, and we're 
we're again excited about that. This is Russell and his family, Miss Belinda and their daughter Jana and Ryan. Uh, they'll be with us on August the second, or excuse me, August the ninth. Uh, they'll be in service with us, sharing a little bit about uh, Story Church. But really, more importantly, we really want to get to know uh, Russell and Belinda. We're super excited again the, the partnership, but also we want to know their family as we can help us to support them and the work that God has called them to in Northwest Arkansas. We do also want to celebrate with uh, with Miss Paula Gathings. Most of you uh, are many of you know Miss Paula. Ms. Paula is a member of our church and she uh, has been serving in Africa, uh, in Tanzania. And this is from her blog. If you don't get her blog and would like to get it, uh, Paula Gathens at uh, or dot wordpress.com. You can read her blogs that she puts out uh, pretty regularly, kind of lets you know what she's doing. But in her most recent blog, she put, I'm excited to announce that the Kinlaws, which is the family she's been working with uh, in Tanzania, they are returning to Tanzania at the end of August. And I have my tickets to return a few days after them. I'll be leaving on August the 24th, unless we have to quarantine for some reason. We will begin school over uh, there on August the 31st. Uh, lots of prayers are needed uh, in this. As you can see, we have the materials, and that was in her blog. Uh, now that to get them over there, uh, clarity on how to use them on my part and the student's part and every other blessing uh, and, and every other blessing God wants to send to our direction. I will continue to need your prayers. As I told you in the last year, besides church, set, church settings, I had never taught elementary. And this year, I will have five students ranging in uh, work from K-5 through grade three. So we're again, super excited for Miss Paula, uh, the opportunity to go and be with the Kinlaws again and serve alongside of them as they're doing church planting and, uh, and leading folks to the Lord and Miss Paula playing her role. And so again, pray for Miss Paula. And if you get opportunity to text her or jump on there and read her blogs and make comments, I know it'll be a great encouragement to her. And we're excited about how God is using her. Uh, well, I want to begin this morning as we kind of dive into the message, uh, share just a story with you. You can bring up that next picture. This is our family. We were uh, on furlough. It's been several years ago. Obviously, you can tell by the size of those kids and that guy has hair. Uh, it was been a few years ago that uh, this picture was taken. We were in the Grand Canyon. And uh, while we were there in the Grand Canyon, we, we were on one of the, the uh, little uh, shuttle buses. And, and the kids, obviously... The Sarah's little and Samuel's in there. You just can't see him, a little papoose there. Uh, but he's a little guy in there. But uh, Sam, or, uh, Ab Abigail and Josiah and, of course, Lydia, we were on this little shuttle bus. And it was funny because uh, Kenya, Josiah, uh, Abigail, and, yeah, Kenya, Josiah, Abigail, myself. We started looking out the windows and we, we put on our glasses. And this is going to look silly. But anyhow, we put on our glasses and we were doing this, looking out the windows and saying, man, look at all these animals. We kept looking out, oh, wow, can you see that? And so Josiah and Abigail kind of picked up on this. And so we're doing it. We, we noticed that Lydia, she was trying to do it. She was, she was she like, she didn't see the animals that obviously weren't there. But anyhow, she didn't see them. So she's looking and looking and she's like, I don't see them. We're like, you gotta, you gotta put on your glasses so you can see them. And so she, she did it this way. She's like, I, I still don't see them. We're like, no, no, you got them on backwards. You got to turn them around. You got to put them on this way. So she finally gets her hands and her, and she's, she's trying to do it and she's not seeing anything. And she realizes at some point her little, and obviously you see, she's pretty small in this picture. She realizes and she says, you guys are kidding, aren't you? We're like, yeah, we all start laughing. Well, go to this next picture. This is her response to that. She was not impressed with our joke that we were all playing on her, but it was, it really was hilarious. By the way, I got her permission to tell this story, but isn't that funny though, how that we can, all these voices around us can convince us sometimes of a truth that's really not a truth. Because I mean, there were no animals. This does nothing. But in her mind, we had convinced her. I mean, this is her family. These are people talking to her. And we had convinced her that this was a reality. And once she realized it wasn't, again, she was very disappointed. It still is a very funny story in our family. But anyhow, in the, in the current uh, climate that we are living in, it is easy for our minds to be taken captive. And I really think that that's what that story shows me is your mind can be captivated by something that may or may not be true. And in the current environment that we're in, our minds can be captivated by all that's going on in our world today and, uh, and for strongholds to be set up in our lives that may or may not be true, that can cripple us and that also can control us. Uh, when that happens though, when these strongholds are set up and these untruths maybe are set up in our lives, uh, we're unable to live the abundant life that Jesus has promised us, that he desires for us to have and to have freedom. We have people in the world that are convincing us of truths uh, that are not truths at all. 
Just because lots of people are saying things uh, or saying something does not mean that they are necessarily true. Our minds can be captivated and strongholds again erected and we must break, break free and help others to break free of strongholds as well and some of these untruths that are around us. We can't allow people to dictate to us how we ought to view things. And I really think that as I'm, I'm watching and reading and so are you, all these things that are coming at us, uh, that we can't allow others and other thoughts dictate to us. When we, do, when we do, we're setting up and we're allowing some strongholds to set up in our lives for the enemy. And we're allowing our minds to be taken captive. And I know that's not our intention, but it's very easy to allow that to happen. Uh, and so this morning, I want to speak to you about spiritual warfare and really speak to you about minds being captivated. The Apostle Paul constantly dealt with, with captivated minds during his ministry as he spoke to Gentiles, he spoke to Jews alike. They had some strongholds, some untruths in their lives that were dictating to them how they ought to live, how they ought to think. And Paul was constantly battling, first of all, for the souls of men that they might know Jesus. And second of all, battling some untruths and some unbiblical, ungodly ways of looking at things. And Paul described his life and his ministry as a battle. And I think that's a wise thing to do for you and I, that we need to look at the world around us and the life that we live. It really is constantly a battle that we're in a warfare. Paul reminded Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 18, to wage the good warfare. He said also in Timothy to share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And then in the end of Paul's life, he would describe his life as this, I have fought the good fight. As followers of Jesus, we need to make no mistake that we are at war every single day. Colossians 1.13 says this, he has delivered us. This is speaking of you and I, those of us who have received Christ as our savior, we're Jesus followers. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, our beloved son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. The kingdom of darkness though, listen, is not happy that we've been transferred out, that Satan and also his minions, there's not a desire for or an encouragement there. There is that as we've been pulled out, they're at war for our soul and for our minds and for truth. We know that our enemy is not flesh and blood, by the way. I think that in, in the midst of all that is going on, we have to be so incredibly careful that you and I are not the enemies and people are not the enemy. Ephesians says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I want to look at how Paul waged spiritual warfare. And it may be, be look, look, look a little different than you might think of when you think of spiritual warfare. Don't turn off and say, well, he's going to talk about casting out demons and something crazy. Stay with me because Paul tells us what spiritual warfare really is, what it looks like, and how to do it as well. It really, spiritual warfare has to do with breaking down strongholds and giving, uh, and giving us freedom from thoughts that have elevated themselves above God but have taken root inside of us. And I wanna give you some thoughts how to be freed from some strongholds that are even going on even today, but also how to stay free as well. Second Corinthians chapter 10 will be kind of our text that we'll be working through. So if you can begin turning there, Second Corinthians chapter 10, it gives us the most clearly defined uh, strategy for spiritual warfare. And again, if you do not believe as a follower of Jesus that you're in spiritual warfare, you are deceiving yourself because all around us constantly, there is these ideas and thoughts and mentalities that are attacking our spiritual well-being and attacking especially the Lord Jesus and who he is and who God is. Not to mention inside of us, our own rebellious spirit that still is present and we must fight against. But 2 Corinthians 10, uh, the context, let me just kind of set it up very quickly. Uh, Paul started the church at Corinth uh, during his missionary journeys. He was the founding uh, missionary and even worked with them for several years and continued to, to work alongside them. But after he leaves, they fall under attack uh, by the enemy. Uh, and I mean the, the enemy by by different thoughts, different ideas, different opinions, and different arguments. Uh, they begin to get into some really grievous sins, and it's very difficult. Division creeps in, and it causes the church to be in a disarray. 
Paul writes the book of 1 Corinthians and, and really tries to correct a lot of these ideas, a lot of these things that have brought them down and a lot of the divisions that are in there. It's a pretty harsh letter. If you've ever read it, it has some harsh language, but it's written out of love because Paul wants them to have freedom in Christ and to experience the blessings of Christ. And now here in 2 Corinthians, uh, he writes the second letter and they've repented for the majority of them have. They've heard Paul's words. They're beginning to correct some of the errors and some of the things that have come in and some of the sins that have come into their congregation. But there's still a small group that are against the apostle Paul. There's still a small group that have different opinions and ideas. They're still trying to captivate the minds of the church at Corinth. So Paul in chapter 10 through 13 of, of 2 Corinthians, he begins to deal specifically with this rebellious group and especially their mentality. And this section of, uh, of 2 Corinthians 10 verses one through six is where we'll be looking, one through seven. He really tells them how he's going to wage war. He's not gonna come in with this powerful idea like I'm Paul and you. He's gonna tell us what it looks like to wage spiritual warfare on those who are taking people captive by their own words, by their own ideas. So I think it's a very applicable passage for us in the world that we're living in currently in the environment that we're living in also. Second Corinthians 10, let's begin reading in verse number one. I, Paul, myself entreat you as he's writing to the church by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with Excuse me, with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. So there's some of those, again, that small minority that's saying, Paul is doing this, doing this, doing this, and they're trying to find Paul. But notice what he says in verse three. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy the strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive uh, to, the, to obey Christ, being, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obe obedience is complete. So again, Paul, as he's writing here, uh, he's preparing to go ahead, head to head with some folks in the church. It's not going to be a pretty situation, but he says, listen, I'm not coming at you personally but I need to, to let you know I am at war. Not with you as an individual, but these thoughts and these ideas that you're presenting that are not of Christ, they're not of God. And he tells them he is going to come in and begin uh, to do spiritual. Remember, Paul's writing this as a letter, but notice what Paul does as he prepares though to engage in the spiritual warfare. And, and I would say this, this is what we have to do also. In the world, as all these voices are coming, as these ideas and these arguments are popping up and telling us how we ought to feel, we've got to fight against letting the world and letting someone else tell us how we should feel and think. So how do we attack these ideas? How do we go at them with spiritual warfare? Well, notice Paul, as he prepares, he tells them how he's going to prepare for spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We must approach spiritual warfare with humility and boldness. Those may sound like two contrary ideas, but we approach it with humility and boldness. As we go head to head with the world around us, and the rapid fire of information that is pushed upon us daily. We need to stand in humility, but then also in boldness, both. Paul says, I walk in the flesh, meaning this, not I walk according to the world, but he says, I walk in the flesh. I'm, what Paul's saying is, I'm just a man. I'm not some spiritual elite, I'm not. I'm just a man, I walk in the flesh. Paul's recognizing that he doesn't possess some amazing power that they don't. So he brings himself humbly and says, listen, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out also. I'm a man like you. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul never saw himself as a spiritual giant, but he saw himself as a man that had been saved by the grace of God. And he was striving to live for the Lord Jesus. So he approaches spiritual war war warfare humbly. Not with, well, I'm gonna get in there, I'm gonna bust it all down, and you're gonna, I'm gonna tell you how it is. He, he approaches it with a humility. 
And friends, if we approach spiritual warfare and the things around us and these strongholds that are building up around us, we can't go with, a, with an idea that I've got this, but no, we're just men, but we're trying to listen to God. We're trying to obey him and we're asking him to give us the ability to understand. But he does, not just with humility, but he comes with some boldness. Notice the boldness he said, we're not waging war according to the flesh. Say, we're about to wage war, but it's not, not because I'm powerful. But the boldness is this, I know this, I'm a man, but, but I have boldness in the Lord Jesus. The, the waging war there is the word uh, strote vol metho, metha. Sorry, I even wrote it down so I could do it right. Uh, it's a Greek word, it means, it's a word we get strategy from. So Paul says our strategy for how we're going to do spiritual warfare, it is not that we're gonna use the ways of men. We're just men, but our strategy is to fight not as men, and what he means by that, I think, is this. I think Paul is telling them, I have no intention of debating you. I have no intention of using human reasoning, human wisdom, uh, arguments of rationalism. I have no plans of using human ideas, human strategies, ingenuity, eloquence, personality, cleverness. The list could go on and on. He says, I don't plan on doing that when I come and when I do this spiritual warfare. But what I plan to do is come in the name of the Lord Jesus so there's a humbleness, but there's also a boldness that Paul has as he approaches spiritual warfare. I think the second thing would be this. We approach, must approach spiritual warfare, warfare with understanding and confidence. So a humility and a boldness, but also an understanding what, what is it really about? What, and even a confidence to know that what we're trying to do, what are we battling? Second Corinthians 10, Paul says this, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Understanding that we must fight spiritual warfare with divine power. So we come out of spiritual warfare with understanding that it's not by our power. We have boldness, yes, because we're, we know that we're just humans and that there's a strategy and that we're coming with divine power. We've got to understand that, that all these ideas floating around us, all this information coming at us, that we don't have to figure all of it out. We don't have to philosophize and try to figure it out. We understand this, that if we're going to understand truth, we're going to have freedom and we're gonna be able to view things properly, it'll come from divine power. We need to understand that the enemy, by the way, is strong. It's a strong enemy all around us. Bring up that picture. This is a picture of Masada. This is in Israel. This, is, this whole upper structure here is, uh, is a picture of what a, a, a fortification or a stronghold is. So when Paul uses that idea of stronghold, when he says that, it is not just uh, a word. It's a picture that's going to pop up in their minds of a impenetrable place, something of power. He says, this is our enemy, these, the, this, this, this uh, fortification. It's impenetrable. But here's the thing about these fortifications. Once those went in for protection, once those went in for safety, it almost became a prison. Because now you're stuck in here. You can't get out. He says, that's what happens when Satan, when lies begin to take hold of people, they get into these fortifications, these strongholds, they're taken prisoner, they're crippled, and that's what we're fighting. That's the enemy is these strongholds that Satan has put up and that men have put up. And he says, listen, do not be fooled. It is, a for, it is a formidable enemy. It's not as simple as we're just gonna go up and knock it out. It is a battle. But also we need to have confidence, not just understanding, but confidence that divine power will destroy the strongholds of the enemy. That we don't have to see all these lies and man, we just can't do anything about it. No, we can, we can do, and, and we're gonna look at that as we move forward because spiritual warfare is about this, tearing down these strongholds that have people captivated inside. So many times people wanna talk about spiritual warfare as fighting demons and rebuking the devil in the name of Jesus, but real spiritual warfare is defined by Paul and he does it in this next part of our text. So you're kind of like, well, what are you talking about spiritual warfare and strongholds? What does that mean? Paul defines what strongholds are. Notice in verse number five, he says, we destroy arguments. So he says, we, we tear down these strongholds. And he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. 
We must approach spiritual warfare with purpose and passion also. As Paul defines, what are the strongholds? What does that mean? What are we attacking? And I would say this, Paul hits it straight on the head uh, with the purpose of it. The purpose of spiritual warfare is about tearing down strongholds. And here's how they're defined. They're defined as every argument and opinion that raises itself above and against the knowledge of God. Here's what it is. It's the arguments and the opinions, the ideas that we know what God's word says about something, and then you have this opinion or idea that oversteps that, that trumps that. And listen, that is so much of what's going on in the world today. We're gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a couple examples at the end uh, and try to apply this, but reality is there's a lot of arguments and opinions that are way above what God says about current situations, about things in our life. And if we allow these opinions and arguments and ideas to come up and we let the word of God come down. He says, I know God says this, but. So then we take, we put God down here. We allow these strongholds to take place and these strongholds take us captive and they grab hold of our minds and we're not thinking clearly. We're not thinking the way that God would have us to think. So many times people uh, are, are stuck in these strongholds and every concept. So a stronghold is this, every concept, every opinion, every reason, every philosophy, every theory, every ideology, every thought that is against God. That's a stronghold. All the anti-God, uh, anti-Christ, anti-Bible ideologies that have so much influence. Those are strongholds that are all around us, by the way, all around us. The purpose of spiritual warfare is again to tear down those, to tear them down, but then take those ideas and take them captive to Christ. Not allow philosophies and ideas to tell me how I ought to think about something, but rather take it captive to Christ and say, Jesus, what should I think about this subject? How should I feel about this? Not what does the world say, not what does the argument say, what does the opinion say, but God, how should I look at this? And we tear down something that's not of the Lord take captive that back to Christ, and then we begin to allow those strongholds to be tore down, those arguments and opinions and the lies, and we take our thoughts, and we, our thoughts, we make them subject to Jesus. Friends, I'm telling you, we need to do some battle in the world we're living in because so many things are taking us captive and crippling us, and Jesus wants so much more for us. Rather than being subject to these strongholds, we need to tear them down. I think sometimes we're afraid, like, how do you do that? What am I supposed to do? I hear all these ideas and thoughts. John 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We were never intended as Jesus followers to be bottled up and to be encapsulated and be captivated by these thoughts that are not godly. And I fear that we're in a place that so much has got us captivated. There's so many strongholds all around us. And we need to go to battle and say, how should I think about this? How should I think about this? Not allow others to tell us, hey, can you see the animals? No, I want to see what God tells me I need to see and understand it according to his plans and his purposes. So one of the purposes is to tear them down. Then the second again is to take captive those thoughts but the last purpose, I think, is this in spiritual warfare is to bring light, the lies amidst the truth so that we can help each other. Because there's some folks in our churches and there are some Christians that have been taken captive into these ways of thinking, these ideologies, and they're captured and we need to tear them down, tear down the, the strongholds and regather our people together to think according to Christ, to think according to his word and his ways. And sometimes we need to help each other. Galatians 6, 1, brothers, if anyone's caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, so those of you who are seeing properly, those of you who are taking captive the ideas and thoughts, those of you who are seeing things the way you ought to see them according to scripture, not according to my opinion or my argument, but according to the word of God. You restore him in a spirit of meekness. Keep watch on yourself, Paul says, lest you be tempted bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of christ for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing he deceives himself this isn't an arrogant attack it is this a spiritual warfare 
to bring our minds and our thoughts in conformity to the way of thinking of Christ. The last thing we need to do in approaching spiritual warfare is to approach spiritual warfare with the proper weapons. To have the understanding of the purpose, the heart that we need to approach it with, and also the passion that we need to approach it with. But we need to approach it with the proper weapons. We're, we're not smarter than the uh, other people on the planet because we're Jesus followers. But here's what we have access to. Remember Paul said divine, divine weapons Ephesians 6, and I'm sure many of you have read this passage when it speaks about the armor of God. Therefore, put on every piece of, the, of, the, of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand uh, your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness, shoes, uh, put on the peace that comes from good news so that you will be fully prepared in addition to all these, hold up your shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Some have said here that the only weapon that's mentioned as we think about our spiritual weapons for what are these, some of these divine weapons that we need to use in spiritual warfare. Some have said that in this passage there's really only one. Uh, I, I really disagree. I think that there are two weapons that are mentioned here in waging spiritual warfare to tear down strongholds. One of them is sword of the spirit, the word of God. That is, we use the word of God when we see a stronghold, opinions and ideas that are contrary to God. We take God's word, we begin to slice it, but there's a second one here. What is it? And you probably noticed in verse 18, he said, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. It is the word of God and prayer. Those are our, our battle tools as we go and we, as we face the, the opinions and the ideas of everything going on around us. It's praying and asking God, help me to discern, help me to understand how I should view what's going on around me, taking the word of God and seeing these strongholds and say, what does God say about this? What does he say not? What does the media say? What does this person say? What does my uncle say? What is that? But what, God, what do you say about this situation. What do you say that I should think and then pray? Second Corinthians, again, Paul said this in verse number four of our text, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power. Friends, we're in a battle for our minds. There are some strongholds that have taken hold and taken root amidst this season that we need to wage some spiritual warfare against I would submit to you that we are in the midst of some of the greatest spiritual warfare of our generation with thoughts, ideas, and opinions. And we must approach, it's kind of in review, we must approach spiritual warfare with humility and boldness, with understanding and confidence, with purpose and passion, and with the proper weapons. So let me, let me just apply this. Here, here's one of the strongholds that I think that has made its way in among us, in us, and maybe in you, or maybe even in myself at times, but fear is, in this pandemic is raising itself against the knowledge of God, and it is a stronghold. People are afraid of things. They're so worried and fearful, and, and here's the thing, it's coming above what God says. Second Timothy 2, so we take the word of God and we say, okay, there's fear, I'm kind of afraid, so what do I do with it? Second Timothy 1, 7, God says, or Paul said this to Timothy, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. That, that's what God is, so fear is not, that's not something we need to subscribe to. We can see it and understand it's there, and say, but, but God, you've given me a spirit of sound mind, a, a proper way of thinking of love, so this fear begins to be torn down so that we're not captivated by it. We're not afraid of everything. And with the Lord Jesus, we have the tools and the power to combat that. Psalm 56, I love this. But when I am afraid, Psalmist said this, I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God. So why should I be afraid? How do you tear down the strongholds of fear? Because there's a lot of stuff. We're like, man, I, it, it, we got some stuff to be afraid of. Yes, but at the end of the day, God is in control. So we tear down this stronghold. We don't allow it to dictate how we think. But we allow the sound mind that God gave us. 
We allow the love that he has given us. We allow his presence to dictate, armed with the word of God and prayer. We need to tear down these arguments and lies that again are crippling and controlling people and take those thoughts captive to Christ. Now, I'm not saying that we, uh, that we throw off restraint and we're cavalier and we just say, well, I ain't gonna do anything because I just trust God. I'm not saying we don't have cautions, but I'm saying this, that doesn't rule us because when it rules us, our faith dwindles and the enemy begins to take control of us and fear cripples us. And now we're speaking about, well, I know God, but when we say God, but, then we're taking him out of the picture and we're letting something else be a stronghold and God is down here, but that's not the way that we live as Jesus followers. He is our heavenly father. and He is still in control in the midst of all that is happening. But strongholds of fear are around us and we have got to battle them with the word of God and with prayer, we approach our fears and our anxieties. A second one, out, and I'll, I don't wanna spend a lot, I'm just gonna throw this one out, Pol politics and government conspiracies. <laughs> and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but uh, these are strongholds uh, that, that have taken some people captive. The arguments and opinions, how many arguments and opinions are there about politics right now and government conspiracies and all that, but they're raising themselves over the knowledge of God. And they're taking our thoughts and they're creating a control. And some folks are just so worried and concerned. But listen, Romans 13, I'm gonna read this. The government, remember, they're not our enemy. They're not against us. It's not that we are against, it's not, there's not a problem here. Romans 13, take the word of God. And look at the government and try to figure out what does God say? Romans 13 says, let every person speaking about, this is you and I, as Paul writes this to the Roman believers, be subject to what? Governing authorities. So, well, I don't like what they're saying. Okay, but they're in a, there's an authority there. Ooh, it's, it's part of our nature to rebel. And if we're rebelling just for the sake of rebelling, that is original sin. That's all the way back in the garden. So take God's word and take the things that are going around us. Let every person be subject to governing authorities. For there's no authority. Now listen to this. There is no authority. There's no buts here. There's no authority except from where? From God. He was like, but the government and they're doing their... Doing. Listen, God it just speaks a word. And it's over. God sets up authorities. Those that exist have been instituted by God... Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God. God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. You say, I don't like that. Well, I don't care if you like it. God's word says some of these things and we're taking down the strongholds of opinions and arguments and saying, God, what do you say? What should I do and not do? And we pray and ask God to lead us and, and to help us to understand. Daniel said it best when he interpreted a dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, who was, a, who was an ungodly man, who was a pagan, but God used him. Here's what Daniel said, the most high, Speaking of God, he rules the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will. So listen, the government's not in control. God is. So it doesn't feel that way. I don't care how it feels. I know this. Why? God's word says it. We pray. We seek him. It doesn't mean that we go blindly. Even Daniel and the Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, when there were things that were done that you could not do that were contrary to God, they disobeyed. There are times, but, there, but let me say this, those are few and far between. So be very, very careful how you allow strongholds to get into your life and tell you how you ought to think about things. Use the Bible and prayer to bring down strongholds and take captive those thoughts and I promise you it will bring a liberality and a freedom to breathe, to live in that freedom and that joy that God has for us. We need to stop letting others 
tell you how you ought to think and feel about things and convince you of truths that are not truths. And here's what we need to do. Get your Bible out and get on your knees and pray. The Holy Spirit will lead you and do some spiritual warfare to gain a proper perspective on what's going on in the world around us. I think if we'll approach with the word of God and prayer, every argument and opinion we come in contact with, we're gonna allow God to do great work inside of us. And we will, we will, I have confidence, we'll tear down some strongholds that have many captive. And here's also the truth. We will, help, we will help one another see clearly from the word of God and through prayer how we ought to see things. And I'm convinced of this. We'll get through COVID-19. We'll get through the upcoming election. We'll get through the racial injustices in our nation together. And not just, listen, not just together, but with God. It's not of no value if we get through just together, but together with God. I believe this, and I think many of you do. Jesus is the hope of the world. Not me or you or our thoughts and opinions. Not the government. Jesus is the hope Lord, let's bring every thought captive to him. Allow him to teach us, to tell us how we ought to think. Because I, I just mentioned two strongholds. But listen, there are strongholds of addiction. There are strongholds of pornography. There are strongholds of shame. Strongholds of every sort that many in our church and our community need to tear down and do some spiritual battle. If you're a child of God, if you're a Jesus follower, Jesus is your savior. He also is the one who help you to live out the freedom that he desires, to help you put in perspective this world that we're living in, and allow you to have peace and contentment. Not in all the craziness, but peace and contentment in him. And I don't know about you, but some of these strongholds that have taken me captive at times, I need them tore down so that I can experience and understand what life is really all about. And to have the confidence in God to see things the way he sees them. Not the way everybody else tells me to see it. Father, we love you. We're so grateful for your presence. God, thank you for your word. God, that speaks to every subject. There's not a situation, there's not a, a circumstance that you do not speak to. You've given us your word. It's living, it's active, and it's ever-present. God, help us to take your word and tear down the opinions and the arguments that have lifted themselves above you God, that we might allow your word, allow your Holy Spirit to guide us, to lead us, to bring us contentment, to bring us joy. Father, the world that we are living in, there are so many strongholds that have taken Jesus followers and lost people alike captive. God, help us to be brave soldiers, to combat the, and tear down the strongholds around us. Not that we do it in our own strength. Help us to always know that we wage warfare not according to the flesh, but we use divine weapons, your word, prayer, our faith. God, may we help set captives free with your power. And Lord, I believe that in our church and even in our congregation, there are those and need to be set free. So Father, help us together with you tear down the strongholds that are all around us and to participate in the spiritual warfare. We already have the victory in Christ. Help us to enjoy the spoils of it, the contentment, the peace, the joy of a life resting in you. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.